COVID-19 continues to present challenges for all of us, including our various levels of government. Joining me now to talk about it in studio is Lethbridge East MLA, Nathan Newdorf. Nathan, welcome back to BCN. Pleasure to be here, Al. Thank you. Let's talk about how tough it's been for Alberta beef producers, in particular what's happening at some of the beef processing plants, Cargill by High River, uh, JBS Foods and Brooks. It's been very tough right now with COVID-19 having a big impact. It's really tough, and it's tough on the, the beef suppliers. They have to be very careful of their, their supply and their feeding management of their stock. And uh, we have such a highly integrated system, and we, pl we supply a huge amount of beef across all of Canada, North America, and even around the world. This is a really big challenge, and we have to get those, those plants open again as quickly as possible. So again, the workers have been impacted by the coronavirus. What about the beef itself? Has it been affected? No, as my understanding that the beef is not impacted at all. This is strictly uh, a human-born illness. I mean, we do know that dogs can be impacted, but uh, it doesn't transfer to the, the, the animals in the, the factory. The meat is absolutely safe, and CFIA is working around the clock to make sure that that product is safe for everybody. Are we going to start seeing a major shortage of beef, though? Should we start stocking up? I don't think, yeah, I don't think we want to get to the panic stage. I think uh, just your, your normal buying habits would be good. We may see a temporary dip in that supply. Uh, but again, rushing out and buying all the meat on the shelf is not helpful right now. If we can just keep cool heads, I'm sure that we'll work this out in, in a very short amount of time. Again, get those factories up and going, get that beef flowing to the, the supermarkets again. You know, Nathan, we're also hearing about raw milk being dumped, and some farmers are saying if they don't have enough government backup guarantees, they're not going to risk planting a crop this year. What help is there really for our farmers right well, now? Well, we have the AFSC, the Agricultural Financial Services Corporation, and it has some, uh, some programs designed to help farmers when their income drops and they have some of these challenges. So right now we've got a couple small measures in place, payment deferrals and interest only payments, but we are watching this very, very closely because again, we need that product to go to market. We need it to be consumed. We don't need to be dumped down the drain, but they have to continue to milk cattle every day. Those cows need to follow that program. So this is something that we're watching and our Ministry of Agriculture is in touch with every day. What about our energy sector? Oil falling below you know, negative territory for the first time ever. Yeah. It's incredible what's happening. I mean, the Trudeau Liberals announced 1.7 billion to help with the cleaning up the old oil wells, the orphan abandoned wells. I mean, that's a start, but many people I talk to in the oil and gas sector say, it's not enough and it's far too late. What are you hearing? Well, we, we're hearing the same things, and we really need the federal government to understand how important the oil industry is, not just Alberta, but in the entire country. This isn't just about filling up your car with, with gas. It, this is about food production. This is about heating our homes. This is about all kinds of energy that we need. Even electric cars use energy. Where's that energy developed from? A lot of times from natural gas plants, that kind of thing. So this is a huge, huge sector. If this goes down, our ability to pay for the public services that we want really is diminished. And, and this is a big, big concern, again, not just for Alberta, but for all of Canada. Well, even the gloves and masks that we're using during the COVID-19 pandemic use petroleum products. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a big, big factor in so much production in so many industries that, again, this integrated system, the high level of development and, and cohesion between our, our industry and the diversity of other industries is dependent on this. And we just can't shut that down overnight. We just can't. Uh, the result would be devastating, not only to our Alberta economy, but literally Canada would be ground to a halt. So we need the federal government to understand that, to provide that stability so that these industries can, can make it through this, this crisis and then recover so that we can have the hundreds of thousands of jobs across Canada come back. That's, that's what makes Canada great is, is people being able to find work, be that entrepreneurial spirit uh, alive and well, and we need that to be able to kick back in when we get through this. Doesn't a lot of that oil money as well go to support hospitals and uh, schools as well? Absolutely. I mean, it, it makes up 5 to 10% of Alberta's budget, so we're talking 5 to $10 billion a year just in direct uh, royalties paid. And you can imagine the challenges to balance our books if we didn't have that, that revenue and that income. And that's just a small portion of it. Then there's manufacturing, and then there's construction, and then there's all these other secondary industries related to that. Uh, this is a big, big deal. And I know there's people that want to see us go green, but they need to realize that if you want a warm house, if you want any kind of transportation, if you want any kind of food on your table, we do need the oil and gas industry. And speaking of oil, I mean, Originally, when the UCP put their budget together, they were planning on $58 a barrel, then maybe next year, $63. Obviously, that's not going to happen right now. So balancing the budget, we're looking maybe, what, 
15, 20 years from now? Well, we'll, we'll have to we see ever? that. I think we can balance a budget, but it is, will be another thing to how quickly we can pay down that debt, right? So right now, um, the focus isn't on balance, balancing the budget. The focus is on providing the people the supports that they need, and then it'll be on stimulus to get them back to work. When that private sector economy rebounds and when it rebuilds, then we start seeing the generation of revenue. Then we can have those discussions as to where we are now or where we'll be then and how do we move forward. Scott Moe in Saskatchewan, the Premier there, was talking about relaunching and reopening their economy in Saskatchewan. Uh, BC's talking similar numbers as well with Horgan, John Horgan. How about here in Alberta? How close are we to relaunching and opening our economy for business once again? Yeah, well, I know the Premier's been working a lot on that. He's, got, he's already mentioned the relaunch plan. He's got a, a great plan in place. Uh, we are hoping to see it implemented a little sooner, very close in, on the heels of Saskatchewan and BC. But uh, with the recent outbreaks, we just have to, again, stress to the community that we can't rush this. We have to make sure that everybody stays safe. Uh, and the real, the real battle is transmission. If somebody from one of those jurisdictions gets in a car and goes visits family somewhere else, that's what we have to be very, very careful of. So there's a lot of tension here. We want this economy opened as quickly as possible but we have to do it in a safe way. We can't, we can't risk a flare up in another region. So there, there's some measures that we have to see coming up. You know, some business owners I've spoken with as well here in Southwestern Alberta say, we're killing ourselves by closing our economy. It's worse than COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. And many of those business owners, Nathan, say, if we can't open our doors in the next 30 days, we're not gonna survive. Exactly, we, we need to see some relief. We need to find some ways of opening these small businesses, the, the, smaller, the smaller sector where they can have maybe one client in at a time or by appointment only. We, we are exploring those avenues. But again, we have to be very, very careful of, of going too quickly. Uh, we wanna make sure that we do this well and don't risk that, that outbreak. And people need to bear in mind, it, it is not just about the, the infection, the disease for the individual. It's the at-risk populations. And then what happens if you overwhelm your health care? Uh, Lethbridge has one hospital, and uh, we have a certain number of beds available there. We can't overwhelm it by 200 patients in Lethbridge alone in a single week. So that's what we're managing against. It's not, it's not just the, the sickness and the spread. It's also about we have a certain amount of resources, and those resources are top-notch, the best in the world, and we're very, very proud of them, but we can't just inundate them with case after case after case, with ICU after ICU. That's the danger and that's the limitation. So there, there's a balance here to be found and we have to be very, very careful in moving ahead. Are we starting to flatten the curve a little bit now? What have you seen? It's, I believe that we have. It is a little challenging because we've upped our testing so much that that testing rate continues to increase and then we're also the population that we're testing. First, we were testing those who were most symptomatic or those who are out of the country and we continue to broaden that. So it's a little bit hard to compare those numbers. Um, I, I believe our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Dina Henshaw, has done an incredible job of making the public aware, tracking that. I think we're very, very close to sort of seeing that peak, but it might be a little soon to say yet. Premier Kenny talked about a five-point plan to relaunch the economy. And number one, the first step is mass testing. What is that all about? Well, that's taking our testing to another level. So right, in, right about now, we're somewhere between four and 5,000 tests per day that we're doing. For COVID-19. Uh, for COVID-19. And we want to take that up to about 20,000 tests per day. So you're going to see a real jump, and you might see a real jump in those numbers, and which can be alarming, but it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing. It's got to be a percentage. Do right? we have the infrastructure to be able to do that, the people to be able to support that? We're really working on that, and I believe that we are. So there are, the government is working very, very closely with Alberta Health Services, with our, our incredible front lines, with our EMS. Uh, we're also looking at getting the Spartan testing kits, which really increase the speed of that testing. And I believe those will be sent to rural areas first so that they can get their results a lot quicker rather than adding that delivery time to, uh, to the rural, back to the city for testing and back to the rural with the results. So we're really hoping to see a change there and that, that jump, which will, which will get us to those numbers that we really need to know much quicker. Now, will the province also implement some antibody testing to determine if people have an, an immunity to COVID-19? We're looking at that uh, and we're following like peer jurisdictions, the European Union, the United States, um, as well as other provinces and, and Canada as well. But we really want to make sure that that, that that technology, that those testing are top of the line, are doing what they're meant to do. They're reliable, trustworthy, safe. And uh, we'll be looking at implementing that as quickly as, as reasonably possible. How about better tracking for those who have been infected with the virus? 
So we've uh, just announced uh, recently that we are looking at a, a tracking app on your phone uh, to allow people to, to allow the government to just trace who might have come in contact with someone with COVID. Some people might be concerned about Big Brother watching. It's like, that's none of your business. Stay out of my business here. That's true. So it's, <laughs> it's really important to know that this is... There's privacy no, issues. There's you know? no infringement of privacy. This uses Bluetooth technology, not GPS. This doesn't link with your contact list. This doesn't store any data like your temperature or anything about you. It is an, it's an anonymous ID, and it's totally voluntary. Because I'm wondering if somebody hacks into that system, I'm not at home, I'm out with my family, somebody hacks in, oh, they're not at home, I can break into their house now. Yeah, no, that, I don't think that's available and it, it deletes, self-deletes from your phone after 21 days. So again, totally voluntarily being uh, combined in conjunction with uh, the Privacy and Information Commissioner uh, being done by like the top technology in the world. And again, this is Bluetooth, not GPS. So it's a little bit different in that. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just there voluntarily so that people, we can more quickly announce to people if they've come in contact with someone else who is found out to, to be infected. The reason I'm bringing some of this up as well, Nathan, is because there were a lot of concerns from the, uh, the privacy commissioner as well regarding Babylon, the app that the premier endorsed right away. And, and I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We should have done more testing before we encouraged everybody to download this app from right. TELUS. Right. Well, this, the, it's my understanding that Babylon has been uh, around in the UK for many years, and it's a, it was a private... Uh, Proposal. We, we sought proposals. We got it. It was vetted and done. Of course, there is being more investigation now. But again, we want everybody to know that they're, this is there for their safety, for their uh, protection. And obviously, with people's medical information, it has to be top of the line security. Now, part of the Premier's um, testing when it comes to COVID-19 is stronger border screening. Does this mean international travel only or is it between provinces as well? Right now, it is just international. There's no barriers for interprovincial, although we do recommend people to stay home where, wherever possible. But with that mass testing, again, if, if they're a part of a vulnerable community or a vulnerable sector or, or hit one of those, those other areas, that mass testing will help that. But again, right now, the highest concern is from international areas, and that's where we'll focus our efforts. Let's talk about the fact that WHOOP updates has been cancelled. We heard recently about the Calgary Stampede cancelled, over $500 million to the Alberta economy gone. Whoop up days here locally in Lethbridge. That's going to be a big hit for our city as well. How is the province going to help our city? Well, we're really working on that. Uh, we are working on building the stimulus package. Again, we're looking at really significant infrastructure projects. Uh, I expect some of that to be announced as early as next week with the Premier's address on relaunching our economy. Uh, setting out some of those objectives, but we want uh, we want to be able to get people back to work as quickly and safely as possible And then we want the work that is being done to spur on other work. So uh, Efforts one of the things that I'm really hoping for and fighting for here in, in Lethbridge is the exhibition park uh, I hate to name out just one. There's many many projects, but that one has a, a significant component to agriculture our food processing our way of life and culture down here. It also has the potential to bring in further private investment. So we're looking at, again, jobs today, jobs tomorrow, and jobs down the road. Now, the province is encouraging us and facilitating the use of more masks in crowded public places here in our city, across southwestern Alberta. Will the province actually provide some of the masks, and will they become mandatory? We are looking at uh, providing those masks and making sure that they're available. We're working on sourcing that right now. Uh, at this time, it is not mandatory. And uh, again, it is just, it's important to reiterate that a mask doesn't uh, protect you from others. It protects others from you. So we just want to make sure that uh, people are understanding that. And it's not a cure-all. Masks can make a difference. Masks are important. And we do encourage them to wear where, where it's prudent to do so in, in larger congested areas. And a lot of this will have to do with how, how the COVID-19 response is. If we have flattened the curve, if we do see that reduction, then we'll, we'll be able to be a little bit more lenient in, on some of those measures. But if we see spikes or if we see outbreaks in certain areas, we may have to adjust uh, accordingly. How about more funding initiatives for, let's say, the UofL, the University of Lethbridge, to help during this COVID-19 crisis, you know, either people who are affected by it or to create some sort of a vaccine? Uh, in terms of research, yeah, uh, I believe research the province, development, right? yeah, I, I believe the the province is working with a number of private agencies, and I believe the university has taken some initiative of their own to do some of that research. I I believe the province at this point in time right now is looking for 
any and all help wherever that they can find it and, and using some of those, those expertise to help us find that solution. So I think we're open to, to that for sure. One of the stories we recently had on Bridge City News was that nine out of 11 doctors are gonna be walking away from the Pincher Creek Hospital, making things tough for them out there. We talked to the mayor and it's a lot of rural doctors are not happy right now, but the province has a plan? The province does have a plan. Uh, a lot of us rural MLAs, and I'm, I'm one of those ones that's half rural and half urban and, and that kind of thing, but we spend a lot of time with the Minister of Health. We have taken a, a lot of the concerns that we've heard back from our constituents, from our doctors, and we've realized and we've really pushed forward the point that rural doctors practice in a way that's a little bit different than, than urban doctors. We need to understand their medical practice, what they do, and uh, a doctor in a, a rural area will be a GP for part of the day, go man the emergency, maybe deliver a baby, do all these different things. So we can't treat their compensation and their uh, practice the same way that a specialized doctor in a larger center would be. So today the, the Minister of Health has made some announcements to help address those specific uh, uh, concerns yeah. and really make it better. Again, we want to reiterate that we want to have the highest level of funding for physician compensation, $5.4 billion. What we really want to try to address is the annual rate of increase to that part of the budget, five to, five to 8% every year. Uh, that's a concern. It's not that we don't want the highest paid doctors in the country, we do. We want the best doctors. What we want to try to curb in, in, in terms of fiscal responsibility is that rate of increase. It's very, very dangerous. Within a few years, that would be $2 billion a year. We just can't, we can't handle that. Lethbridge East MLA, Nathan Newdorf, thanks for stopping by today. My pleasure, Hal. Thank you so much.